Welcome to Latina in America, your bilingual destination for all things Latina about our diverse culture, professions, and passion to travel. I am Rosie. Our special guests will share their career journeys and will take us to amazing places around the world. On some episodes, they will take you on those journeys in Spanish. Así es, en español. So come on and join me. Let's learn and travel. It is so good to be with you today, listening to this captivating episode with Karina Chavarria, a remarkable Latina equestrian and biotechnology professional dedicated to promoting inclusivity in the equestrian world and diversity in STEM research. And of course, we are going to talk about travel. So Karina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Rosie. I'm really excited to be here. I learned about you in social media. And one thing that captivated me was your passion for equestrian. You are the Latina equestrian. That is your username in Instagram. And I was fascinated by your story. So the first thing I'd like to ask you is, what is your heritage? So my family is from Cuba. And we immigrated to the United States when my parents did. And I lived in Miami, was born and raised there, and now I'm in San Francisco. And how diverse is Miami, isn't it? Yes, very diverse. And so many representations of all of South America, Central America, the Caribbean, all the islands. It's a beautiful place to grow up and live in. And one thing that you are passionate about is equestrian horses. Tell me, how did you get to be so interested in that? And how was your beginnings in the equestrian world? You know, growing up in Miami, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for riding. And I came from very humble beginnings with my family, so they couldn't afford to pay for lessons for me. But whenever my birthday came around or... Christmas came around, I always asked, please, can I go horseback riding? And since I was little, I always loved horses. You know, the typical horse girl that everybody talks about. And so I found my fix where I could. And I actually really got into horse and equestrianism when I came to California as an adult, because I now could afford my own lessons. I was a late bloomer into the equestrian world. <laughs> But that is so great because Also, it gives us the opportunity to know that there is no specific age to get started, that any age is fine. And uh, the important thing is when the opportunity comes, that you take advantage of it. So how do you find out about what you could do in the equestrian world? How do you find out the places to go, what things are available for you, how accessible it was, and everything else related to that now in this new city that you're living in? When I moved, I found that I had some extra time and I did some research online and I just looked for barns nearby. And then I just went for my first lesson as a trial and I got hooked and I just went as often as I could. Now, I always add the asterisk that being in a question, being in horses is very expensive. It's not as accessible as I would like it to be, but where I can, I ride. Whenever the opportunity presents itself again, I go when I can. And when you go riding, is there lessons that are offered to you? What to expect your first time? What, what is it like? If it's your first time, you'll probably just be able to take your tennis shoes and some comfortable pants. And the first lesson is really just getting to know the horses. How do you put on the tack? How do you get on the horse safely and off the horse safely? What does it feel like to walk, to trot, and to canter, which is the kind of each progressive step as it gets a little bit faster? And so it takes a long time. You know, as an adult, you don't know what it feels like being on a horse. It's a thousand to twelve hundred pound animal underneath you. So you really have to learn to move with the horse. And that's a very new feeling for most people. It took me a whole year, actually, to learn how to canter. So I would say anybody who's starting out, don't feel rushed. Don't feel like you should be hitting certain milestones at certain times. Everybody is different. And as you go along, you'll know when you're ready to progress to the next step and your trainer will be there to help guide you. Yes, definitely. I remember my first time, you know, it was an experience I never forgot it. And what you just said, moving with the horse is something that you need to learn to do. But it was such an amazing feeling, actually. And I remember trying for the first time. 
And now that you are an expert writer, what kind of things are available once you have some experience? What kind of things are available for the person to do? Yeah, so there is a very big business in competing. So there's different types of disciplines. There's hunter jumper, which I guess would be what most people think about when you go and compete. So you're jumping over these cross rails or different courses, right? So you have a certain way that you're going to do that. There's also eventing, which is a combination of cross rails. You're also doing dressage, which is the fancy movements where they really pick up their legs. And it's just so beautiful to watch. And then eventing also has cross country. So you're jumping over logs, you're going through water. It's much more fast paced and fun. Yes. And I remember that there are two different equestrian riders. So there's the classical, which is the, very much the ones I was describing. There's also Western, uh -huh. uh, which I haven't had too much of a chance to dabble in. But mm -hmm. when I go trail riding, it's usually Western. People will know it because the saddle has the horn in the front, which is helpful if you're doing cattle reining. So if you're needing to bring in cattle and you got to hook them, that's the area to hook on. And it, I would say for anybody who's starting out, it's a nice, comfortable saddle. If you're in classical, the saddle doesn't have that horn. So you really have to use your legs to keep your seat. Ah, oh, interesting. And in this world of equestrian, what type of challenges do you see as far as accessibility and visibility for people like us? There is the historical narrative of it is that This is really only for the elite. Being an equestrian is a symbol of status, a symbol of money, a symbol of power. When I first went to a barn, when I first got here, they actually thought I was the groom. And to have to explain, no, I'm here for lessons. So some barns can be not welcoming for our people. And I think that's the, the most important aspect of finding a place to ride. Is finding a place where you're comfortable, where others acknowledge you for who you are and are there to support you and help you, regardless of whether you have money to compete or not. Because some barns can be very competition focused and, and they'll tell you up front. They'll say, you know, within six months, you have bought a horse and you need to be competing consistently versus other barns are there because of the love of the horse. And they want to share that love with other people, whether they can afford to or not. And I've been lucky to find barns like that here in the East Bay. That's amazing. For the joy of riding is something that if you are interested in doing it, just try it because it's a wonderful experience. This is phenomenal. And now let's take a few seconds for a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by our parent show, Life 100 Podcast, as seen on Oprah Daily, where we talk everything about life in English, in Spanish, and also in Spanglish. You can listen at life100podcast.com or on your favorite platform. And now, back to Latina in America. And now we're going to pivot to your profession. Tell me, you are in biotech? Yes, I'm biotechnology. <laughs> biotechnology. So tell me about it. Tell me how did you find out about that particular profession and how was your journey to do what you do now? So to start that story, I have to go way back to high school. And the reason I'm going back is because I really stumbled into science and biotechnology very, very young age because I was having um, seizures when I was in high school and no doctor could figure out why I was having these. And so it turned out that I had a brain tumor. And before they found that tumor, I did a lot of research because I had a doctor tell me after doing extensive testing and they couldn't find anything that I was faking my seizures and that I needed to go see a psychiatrist. <laughs> typical, <laughs> typical. Been there and done that. Absolutely. Yes. So, and I think that's unfortunately an experience that people from underrepresented communities find themselves experiencing a lot because doctors just don't believe us. And it's very, very sad. And so I took matters into my own hands and I started doing my own research. I switched my doctors and they were finally able to find it. So I underwent a couple of rounds of radiation because it ended up growing back. Thankfully, everything good now. But that was the start to my journey into science because I got thrown into healthcare and 
I had to learn about it. It was not an option for me. Yeah, because you um, have to learn to advocate for yourself, especially when everything that is said is going to be questionable at one point or another. So definitely I can see how you need to find as much information as you could. And, and what took place from that point? At that point in high school, I ended up taking AP Biology, so the college level course, just to start learning about cells and why do they become cancerous? Why do they replicate the way they do? And when I got into Florida International University, where I did my undergrad, again, minorities are not represented in the STEM field. And I stumbled upon a National Institute of Health grant called MBRS RISE. That grant was to help foster minorities in STEM research. I went into the lab and I started doing Alzheimer's research, genetic research on childhood leukemia, looking for those genetic markers. So I really got to be in the lab and experience what it was like to be a scientist, which was so exciting for me. Absolutely. That experience of what can this lead to? What was it from that point to being in the lab to what you do right now? How was that journey for you? So different. So I left the lab. I applied to actually do my PhD at 21 and was accepted, was going in. But the school that I had applied to had a financial crisis in that year and they had to let go because doctorates are paid. You don't pay to do your doctors, they pay you. Yeah. And so they cut me because I was probably one of the youngest, most inexperienced. And I had to pivot. And I went into teaching because in Miami, there weren't a lot of opportunities for STEM. So I actually am very grateful for those five years that I spent teaching and being a department chair because I learned what it is to explain to other people about science in ways that they can understand. For people who really don't know about science. Maybe this is not their interest. And so you have to find ways to tell a story about cells and how they become who you are as a person. After that, I had a friend that was in the organ and tissue donation field and recommended for me to apply. And I said, you know what? This is a new avenue. I'm going to go and work in this. And so I went and I became a family advocate. And what that is, is you go and go into the hospital. And unfortunately, this is the worst day for most people, for most families. And so they're losing a loved one. Mm -hmm. And my job there was to go and explain to them what was happening. What is brain death? Are you ready to disconnect? And if you are, there is one additional choice that you can make or you can honor for your loved one. And that is in donating organs and tissues to help save other people's lives. And so I did that for a year. And it was one of the most humbling, beautiful, sad, joyful experiences of my life. It was just a whole range of emotions. And I took so much from that job and just learning to work with families. And then my husband was getting relocated to the Bay Area. And this is why I say the story is funny is I thought I was applying for the organ procurement organization here in California. And it turned out I had actually applied to a biotechnology company well, who was working in this. <laughs> and I didn't know that until I did my first interview. So I had to quickly pivot and, you know, being a Latina in STEM, I had already a lot of experience under my belt, but there's something to be said about the imposter syndrome. Glad up here. Please, 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 please. Tell us more about it. Vamos, díganos, díganos. Yes, I felt I don't know enough. I've never been in business. I have no idea what I'm going to do. And this was a brand new company. I would be the third hire. I'd be working directly with the CEO and the VP of business operations. Just building out operations, what it looked like. And I remember thinking to myself, I can't mess this up. Latinas are not in this space. A woman from a Cuban background in STEM building a biotech company. I have no idea what I'm doing. How can I be in this position? And I am so thankful for my husband in that respect because he is also um, Latino and he just encouraged me, take up the space, do it, try it. If you don't make it, then it's still an experience where you learn from and you take that to the next place you go to. And so I took a leap of faith and I have been with this company now for years and I 
built out the operations <laughs> for it. <laughs> amazing. Isn't that amazing? The things that are ahead of us that we cannot see. But when we take a chance of this opportunity, just try. Anytime is a good time to try something new because you never know how far it can take you. And in your case, it's so important. And I'm so glad that you took that opportunity and that you move forward and you are capable and you're prepared and you're educated and you prepare for this moment, even if you don't think that you did. So I'm so glad that everything worked out for you because we need more people like us in technology, in science, so that a lot of the medicine that comes from it have enough sample and enough experience from people like us so they can be applied to us. Unfortunately, we are not included in many of the studies. And it's important because one medicine or any other thing in, in STEM that you do, it might react different depending on the person, the ethnicity and things like that. So it's important. It's important what you do. And I thank you for taking that chance. You know, for our people, we are not represented in science. When we do vaccine trials, when we do stem cell trials, we're not represented. And something I'm very prideful in this company is that we're recovering stem cells to help fill that gap, especially for minorities who mm -hmm. cannot find a match. If you have leukemia, if you have lymphoma, finding a match that's outside of your family is very difficult. And the registry that exists for stem cells is severely limited when it comes to racial and ethnic backgrounds. And so I'm really excited to be contributing to a solution for that and for our people who have these blood cancers, have these blood disorders to find a match and be able to live a second chance at life. That is wonderful. What will be the best way to get in touch with you or to with the organization so that this information is available to them and they can take a step to help make a difference? What will be the best way to contact for that particular purpose? Yeah, my Instagram is always open, as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. I'm Latina Equestrian on Instagram, and I'm happy to take any questions. But something I would encourage everybody to do, and I think most people don't know, is be the match, which is the main hub of stem cells for donation. If you have leukemia or lymphoma, they are always accepting new donors. And it's such an easy process. You go to be the match.com, you register, they send you a swab to your home. You just swab the inside of your cheek, which takes some of those cells. You ship it back and then you're just listed on the registry. So if anybody is searching with their oncologist through that registry and you happen to be a match, they'll give you a call and you can go through some of the testing, make sure that you're still eligible, healthy enough. And you go in and you donate your stem cells and, and you'll have just a short recovery after that. But you save somebody's life. And it's just such an easy process to do. And can you walk us really briefly what it's like to donate stem cells? What takes place? How is that process? There's kind of two ways that you can do it. There's the plasma, which is basically if you've ever donated blood, it's the okay. same. It's through the arms. Okay. Um, you do take some medication right before that to help those stem cells, encourage them to come out into the bloodstream so they can be recovered. The other way is through the hip, which I think is what most people are, are aware of. It is an outpatient. You're not going to be going into the hospital and staying, but they'll monitor you afterwards. So they just extract the stem cells directly from your bone marrow. Being completely honest, it can be painful. There will be pain management for you. But again, this is a personal decision and something that you can make that decision about as that process comes up. Of course, because the thing is that people are not even aware of what is available and they're not even aware that there is not enough representation so that when other people are in need, there are no resources available. So that definitely will make a difference. I'm so glad that you share this information with us. And I'm so glad that now more of us know at least where to get started and then looking for information. This is this is amazing, amazing. And now we're going to pivot one more time because, you know, I love to talk about travel. Travel for me is one of my favorite things that I learn so much. And we become more understanding of our humanity when we travel. What is your favorite place to travel and a place that you would love to go and learn? I'd have to say my favorite place I've been to and I just dream of going back is Capri in Italy. It was so beautiful just being on a boat, going into the Blue Grotto. So it's a little cave you can only access through a boat. And you literally lay down on the boat 
And then you go into the cave and the water illuminates and the whole cave is a bright blue illuminated color. It's gorgeous, gorgeous. And the Italian people are just so welcoming, delicious food, pasta, wine, gelato. I mean, I'm so happy there. (laughs) (laughs) I can tell, I can tell you're ready to go back for what I hear. (laughs) Absolutely. And I'm excited to take my son back. We actually chose an Italian name for him, Gianluca. But for a place I would love to see, you know, my heart is torn. I would really love to conocer Cuba. I would love to (laughs) understand what Cuba looks like and its people and where my heritage is from. And it's just such a beautiful melting pot there of African culture, indigenous culture. And I I want to experience that firsthand. And I I am torn because my family fled there. They lost Mm -hmm. everything um, in that regime. And so hopefully one day I will see a free Cuba. I hope that my son will be able to see a free Cuba. But another place, too, I would love to see is New Zealand. I am very nerdy and I love Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yes. And it's such a beautiful country that I would love to experience. It's just untouched beauty. How I picture Earth to have been like thousands and thousands of years ago. And I, I want to know what that looks like. The waterfalls, the greenery, the lushness. Right? Yeah. Even uh, down into the ocean with the coral reefs. It's just, it's untouched. Wow. I'm telling you, you just have taken us in a couple of minutes to beautiful places all at once. I'm ready to join you. I'm ready to join you. And I hear our listeners because we need to experience those things. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. That's why I said you just go, just go for whatever you can, but try these experiences because it's just going to change your life. It's going to change your entire way of thinking. Everything it changes everything. And what a beautiful way to conclude this episode. And the next question is, what will be the best way to get in touch with you? Is your Instagram any other place that we can reach out to? Yeah, my Instagram is probably the easiest one, Latina Equestrian. But you can always look me up on LinkedIn as well, Karina Chavarria. And I'm always open to sharing my experiences. I I love to connect with others, especially other Latinas and Latinos who are interested in coming into STEM. One of my passions when I was teaching was getting students into these fields. So if you're interested, you have some questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to chat about horses as well, about Lord of the Rings. I'm an open book. So (laughs) you are an open book. Yes. And in the show description, I'm going to include all the links. So that it will be easily accessible and then we can get moving forward with this. Thank you so much, Karina, for sharing all your knowledge, your experiences and your passion, your passion to make a difference. It is truly appreciated. And for that, I am grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rosie. Thanks for finding and subscribing to Latina in America so you don't miss a thing. And if you like this episode, give us a five-star review so we can be put on front of more listeners. For details and show notes and how you can connect with and support our guests, please go to latinainamericapodcast.com. Email us at latinainamericapodcast at gmail.com and follow us on Instagram at Latina in America. Links can be found on the website. This has been Rosie, a Latina in America.